Welcome to 10 Minute KQL. These short 10 minute sessions will teach you KQL, allow you to get hands on practice in a lab environment, and provide some homework to practice after the session. This is the ninth video in the KQL Intermediate Series. In the last session, we introduced part one of joins. In this session, we'll continue joins in part two. If you find value in these videos, please support the channel by hitting the like button. And if you want to receive notifications of new videos, hit the subscribe button with the notification bell. In part one of the KQL join series, we introduced different types of keys used to link two data sets together. And we learned how to complete our first joins. Today, we'll learn some strategies for optimizing our joins. Then we'll move on to discuss the different types of joins. One way to approach joins is to first identify the two data sets you want to join, understand why you want to join them, and envision what the output data set will be. In part one, we join the customers and sales tables in practical exercises. So let's go back to those two data sets. In this scenario, we want three columns from the customers table and two columns from the sales table, in addition to our key. Also, we only want to see the most expensive purchases for each customer. With that general vision of an output data set, we can start to filter each table and prepare it for a join. Let's first just write a query where the output data set has three fields of interest from the customers table. We've selected the occupation, state, and city, along with the unique customer key. As we look at the size of the data set, we can see we have over 18,000 records and four total fields. Now let's write a second query that has two fields of interest from the sales table and only has the maximum sale for each customer. We want to see the sales amount field and the product key field, along with the joining customer key. In this case, we used argmax to find the maximum sales amount for each customer in the customer key field. In addition, we've projected the product key that's associated with the sale. When we gauge the size of this data set, we can see it has three fields and it has over 18,000 records. So from a size perspective alone, both data sets are pretty close. It's often the case that one data set is small while the other one is large in size. And in those situations, you want to place the smaller data set first for optimization. Let's keep both queries, but let's transition them into variables by adding let statements and adding a semicolon at the end of each statement. Now let's join the two data sets. If it was clear that we had a small and large data set, we could simply place the smaller of the two variables first, and that would represent our left table. If we didn't filter the data sets, there'd be a lot of processing power being used, and it's possible it could fail our timeout. We can also see that the customer key is duplicated, which is expected. We may want to clean up and organize the output, so let's do that now with a project statement. What if we wanted to take the output data set and join it with a third table to add extra information about each product? We can follow the same general process of first sampling the products table, finding the information we need, filtering out what we don't need, and joining on a product key, then transitioning that to a variable that we can add to our original query. Now that we've finished creating our products query, we can add a let statement and join it to our existing data set. We can see again that it took less than a second. Now we want to clean up the output a little. We can just move the project line down if we want. Finally, let's sort by sales amount and occupation so we can start to get some insights from our data set. With this output data set, we could transition the information into a graph to visualize it or begin to ask additional business related questions about customer sales. In the previous examples, the keys in both tables had the same name. This won't always be the case. In some data sets, the key field names will be different on each table. In this situation, you can replace the common key with a definition of the field on the left table and the field on the right table that will serve as keys. 
In this example, they both have the same name of customer key. When we run the query, we see there's no change in the results. We can easily simulate tables that have different field names by changing a column name. On the first join, we join the customer's table with the sales table, and we did it on the customer key field. We can easily change the name of the customer key field in the customer's table to C key. When our field names that contain our key are different, we use dollar sign left, and then we put the name of the field that represents the key on the left table. We use a double equals, then place dollar sign right, and place the field that represents the key on the right. In all of our examples so far, we just typed in join. There are many kinds of joins, and the default join type is an inner unique join. To envision what's happening, we can think about a Venn diagram. The inner unique join first deduplicates records on the left table based on the key and matches it with rows on the right table that also have the value of the key. If you remember, our first table only had unique customers for each key, which were already unique and deduplicated. But our right table had many sales records for each customer. When we went to make the second join using the product key, the default inner unique join only selected one record for each product. If you remember, we started out with over 18,000 records. And our final output is under 100 records. If we wanted to match all the products on both the left and the right table, we can use a different kind of join. If we want to define the type of join, we first type in join, then kind equals, then we enter the type of join we want. Again, the inner unique is the default join type. So this doesn't change the output of our query at all. When we run the query, we can see it works just fine. After our first join, we had over 18,000 records. And after our second join, we had under 100 records. Again, the inner unique join only provided records for each unique product type based on the product key. If we wanted all combinations to appear in the output data set, we can change the type from inner unique to inner. If you have experience with SQL, the inner join is the default, and it may be what you're used to. Although KQA has many types of join that allow for maximum flexibility, it can also be a little confusing to have a solid understanding of the different types. Just remember that the inner unique deduplicates the left field, then joins to the right field. The inner join allows for combinations of both tables based on the key match. So if the inner unique deduplicates the left, can you have multiple records from the same key value on the right? To find out, let's try this example. Let's first sample the product table. We can see there's only one unique product ID per product. So let's put that as our left table, and it's already deduplicated. But what about the right table? Let's sample the sales table and sort by product ID. We can see we have many duplicates since different customers bought the same product over time. So what will the output be if we join the two data sets using an inner unique join? As we put the product table on the left and the sales table on the right, then sort by product ID, we can see we still have many duplicates. It took only the unique values from the left table, which were already deduplicated, and matched them with all of the values from the right table. Now we know the difference between the inner unique join and the inner join. We can see that the type of join significantly changes the output data set. In part three of the join series, we'll focus on the four major categories of KQL joins, the inner, outer, semi, and anti-joins. We'll also determine how to select the right type of join for the problem we're trying to solve. For homework, use the free ADX environment. 
If you need instructions on how to access this free data set, refer to Lesson 2 of the KQL Beginner Series. Use the Help Cluster and Contoso Sales Database. Practice both inner unique and inner joins with the Sales Table and Products Table. Once you've completed both joins, reverse the tables from left to right and run the same queries to see the difference in the results. If you notice any differences, be sure to understand why the differences are occurring. That's it for part two of the join series. We'll continue with part three in the next session. If you find value in these videos, please support the channel by hitting the like button. And if you want to receive notifications of new videos, hit the subscribe button with the notification bell.